This is Ireland, or more specifically the Republic of Ireland, which is a sovereign nation that is home to 5 million people who are all quickly becoming some of the wealthiest citizens in the world. Ireland now has a GDP per capita of over $80,000, meaning they are well ahead of traditionally wealthy nations and regions like Switzerland, Hong Kong and Norway, and only placing behind statistical outliers like Luxembourg, Singapore and Qatar. What's more is that Ireland is on track to be the fastest growing economy in 2020, a year that has seen most nations fall behind. It has achieved this despite historically being very dependent on trade and tourism, which has of course been a lot more difficult in a world of closed borders. So it looks like there should be a lot to learn from this country that could potentially be adopted to our own economies so that we too may share in the luck of the Irish, right? Well, that's what the figures might have you believe, but it may not be the whole story. Frequent viewers of the channel will know that GDP figures alone can leave out some very important details about the true prosperity of a nation and the people living within it. So to see if Ireland is more a miracle of paperwork, we need to look at a few key areas. How has Ireland become so wealthy despite its history of being poor and oppressed? Is this wealth going to benefit the citizens of the nation? And is this Irish strategy something that all nations could adopt? Oh, and of course, while we're here, it should go without saying that we're going to put Ireland on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard. This video is brought to you by Trends, the internet's ultimate knowledge hub for entrepreneurs and aspiring ones alike. With a subscription to Trends, you'll gain exclusive access to live Q&As hosted by industry-leading startup CEOs, not to mention an invaluable content library with articles that I know you guys are absolutely going to love reading, like this article on 15 growth hacks to help you grow your startup, or this one about the rise of esports. Try out Trends for an entire week or for just $1 by going to trends.co slash economics explained. Again, that's trends.co slash economics explained. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. Now, Ireland is a member of the European Union and unlike their estranged mother, they have remained so. This has in many ways been a relationship that the nation has been able to leverage to truly make the country what it is today. We will get to those benefits later, but there are also some major drawbacks. For starters, they are using the Euro, which brings with it a collection of disadvantages. We have covered these disadvantages on our videos on Brexit, Greece, Germany and Italy, so I don't want to repeat too much here, but in short, not having control over your own currency means you don't get to set your own interest rates and you are also indirectly responsible for other, less prosperous members of the union. This lack of autonomy means that countries that want to adopt new economic policies or implement new schemes for growth can be limited in doing so. This is part of the reason that most European nations have seen very little GDP growth in the last decade. The nations that are doing well, like Germany, are being held back by places that are doing poorly, and nations that are doing poorly are being trodden on by places that are doing well. Despite this unfortunate back and forth, Ireland has managed to almost double in size in the same decade that most member states went nowhere, and a lot of this has to do with raising all kinds of money. You may have heard the term double Irish with a Dutch sandwich. It's an amusing term that's used to describe the intricate tax loophole where international corporations will exploit intellectual property and corporate expense laws in Ireland and the Netherlands. Again, we have done a video on this little scheme before and we found that major institutions like Apple were using it to hoard massive piles of cash without having to pay tax on it. All of those trillions of dollars have been parked in where else but Ireland. Now you might be thinking that trillions of dollars in foreign investment sounds great and kind of answers the questions about how Ireland got so rich, but not so fast. There are two major problems with this particular arrangement. The first is that it doesn't exist anymore. The loophole that made this whole system possible was closed by an Irish law in 2015 which meant no new corporate structures could be set up, and the ones that did still exist had until 2020 to find other arrangements. Since it is now 2020, there is no more double Irish. However, that doesn't mean the money is gone. In the two decades that this system was abused by major corporations, the companies involved piled up trillions of dollars in Ireland. Which leads to the second problem. Just because money is sitting there in Irish accounts does not mean it is going to benefit Ireland. The whole reason these companies chose to do business in Ireland in the first place is that they didn't need to pay tax. If the country turned around and started taxing this income to put towards, well, you know, public services, then these companies would just go and find themselves an alternative in a more accommodating country. And of course, to provide these services, 
there are a few thousand well-paid accountants and lawyers working in Ireland, which is a boost to the local economy, but it's not exactly putting money directly into the pockets of regular Joe. But Ireland had a plan. You see, it knew that as soon as these companies tried to take this money back out to the United States to use for reinvestment or dividends or stock buybacks, they would need a Canada's income and pay tax on it. So it was a great way to save money tax free, but it kind of put a lock on that money to use for anything useful. So Ireland let them use it in Ireland without too much of a penalty. Without the money leaving the country, the companies involved have been able to invest into research and development which can benefit their operations worldwide. This is a win-win. Ireland gets jobs and investments into their local economy and the companies involved get something to do with their money in a very business friendly environment. In fact, this friendly arrangement actually goes well beyond this single tax loophole. Today, Ireland is one of the largest technology centres in the world, with operations from silicon chip manufacturing to medical research centres spread across a population of less than 5 million people. The reason they set up operations here of all places, rather than Silicon Valley or Seattle or Shenzhen, extend beyond just tax, and can be more well classed as Ireland just being a really good middleman. This is Shannon's International Airport. It's not a particularly remarkable airport in its own right, but what is just outside the gates really is. The Shannon Free Trade Zone was established in 1959 as a way to encourage businesses to set up operations in the country. You see, prior to this, Ireland really struggled to attract international investment because the whole place was viewed as very unstable on account of its fight for independence and a selection of headlines that didn't make global executives particularly excited to go there on a business trip. This free trade zone though, well that was something to get excited about. What it did was mark out a 600 acre plot of land around the airport to be established as a business park where local import, export and business taxes did not need to be paid until the goods left the area. What this meant is that companies could set up manufacturing centres in this little area, fly in parts and then fly out finished products without lofty tariffs that were commonplace in the world at this time. Now you might be thinking, oh great, another tax loophole, but it wasn't exactly. The companies involved still had to pay tax in whatever country they ended up selling their products, they just avoided taxes during the actual assembly phase. In a sense, it kind of just made the area the world's first and largest airport duty free zone. This little arrangement, mixed with the nation's very strong policies on intellectual property rights, attracted companies like Intel, Lufthansa, De Beers and GE Capital Aviation Services. In fact, Sony's first international manufacturing operation was in Shannon Island of all places. Now in fairness, almost any country in the world at the time could have pulled a similar trick but it probably would have not been quite as popular because Ireland did have some other things going for it as well. It had a great central location between Europe and the United States, the two largest industrial centres in the world at the time. It also offered a sneaky backdoor into the European economic community, the predecessor to the European Union, for American companies that would have otherwise had to pay significant markups on imports into this little European club. What's more is that it was home to an English speaking population that was very well educated. Being able to manufacture silicon chips tax free was all well and good, but it's not a job that can be done by just anyone, so this workforce went a long way. This whole system served to boost the local economy, bring businesses into an otherwise unremarkable airport and create highly skilled high paying jobs in the Irish economy that were all being paid for by companies abroad. Of course it must be recognised that the system was not perfect. For starters, this whole system revolved around an airport. People who have watched our video on the merchant navy will know that most international trade is done using ships rather than aircraft given how much cheaper they are to operate at scale. This has meant that the country can only really attract companies that manufacture very small high value products like aircraft parts, computer components and diamonds. This was somewhat limiting but with Ireland's modest population it could probably be called more of a feature rather than a bug. Even if they did have access to mass shipping, low cost manufacturing was never going to be their thing. The other problem with this system is that it's somewhat obsolete these days. Before trade deals and in a time with widespread import and export tariffs, this free trade zone was an amazing tool that companies could use. Today it's somewhat unnecessary. 
In fact, the Shannon Free Trade Zone lost nearly all of its special privileges in 2003, but despite being little more today than just another industrial centre outside an airport, it is still home to over 100 international firms that directly employ over 10,000 workers and tens of thousands throughout the rest of the country. At a foundational level, this is what has given the country such great metrics. Companies have decided to just stick with Ireland. We recently explored the economy of California, and a lot of what we found out about that state's industry is very similar to what is going on here in Ireland. Today, Ireland doesn't have anything particularly appealing about it. Global tax loopholes have been closed, free trade zones have been made irrelevant, and sure, its domestic tax rates are low, but there are cheaper alternatives. The thing that has made Ireland so successful is that there are no other more compelling options that would make it worth moving the significant infrastructure now set up in the country out of it. Very similar in many ways to how Hollywood is the go-to place to make movies because it is home to all of the companies and people that make movies, Ireland is the go-to hub for financial services and technological development because it is home to all of the companies and people that do this stuff. Perhaps the best example of this is GCAS or General Electric Capital Services. We have mentioned this earlier, but I would imagine most of you have never heard of this company or know what it does. But what it is, is basically just a rental service for aeroplanes. General Electric will buy up planes, primarily from Airbus and Boeing, and then rent those planes out to airlines all across the world that don't want to have to pay the hundreds of millions of dollars up front for an aircraft. A quick side note is that this is a great marketing tool for GE because they will not buy up planes for this fleet that are not fitted with GE jet engines. So if Boeing and Airbus want to attract the world's biggest consumer of aircraft, they better think twice before sticking a Rolls-Royce engine on them. To give you an idea of just how large this company is, it owns more planes than United, Delta, American Airlines and Emirates combined. Back during the free trade zone, Shannon's airport was the only logical headquarters of this global operation because it was buying up planes from both Airbus in Europe and Boeing in America and then shipping them out to airlines all over the world. Today, it could do this from anywhere, but it is already established in Ireland, so it may as well stick around. So the big question is then, do all of these multinational operations actually benefit the people of Ireland? And the answer is, well, yes, sort of. Of course, for the people directly involved in these businesses, it is great. They will earn lots of money and do very well for themselves. But for everyone else, it is causing a lot of the same problems we have seen in places like San Francisco. Extremely high rents and cost of living are being driven by this influx of foreign investment and it is leaving average workers in more traditional roles behind. This is a serious problem that the country will have to address or it will face similar social issues to other industrial centres around the world. A two-speed economy. Now to put Ireland on the Economics Explained national leaderboard. This will be a fun one because of just how unique Ireland's history has been. Starting off with size, the nation has a GDP of $398 billion as of 2019 and this figure is actually likely to increase in 2020. This gives the nation a 7 out of 10 because it must be remembered that it is still a relatively small country with a modest population. That small population though makes its GDP per capita figure extremely strong. With each resident sharing an $80,000 worth of that output, it's only beaten by the statistical outliers that we saw earlier. It gets an easy 10 out of 10. Stability and confidence is quite strong. Despite its short and tenuous history, the nation has established itself as a reliable centre of international business. All of the tax breaks in the world would mean nothing if companies could not be sure that the government wouldn't turn around and nationalise their enormous piles of money, so it gets an 8 out of 10. It's not quite Switzerland just yet, but it's certainly getting there. Growth. Well, there's not much to say here. In the past decade, the nation has doubled its economic output at least by GDP figures. This is on top of a long-running trend that has seen Ireland grow from impoverishment to the advanced centre of business it is today. It gets a 10 out of 10. What's more is that it's likely to be one of the few countries in the world that will report economic growth in 2020, even if it will be slightly more modest than in recent years. Finally, industry. Again, this is interesting. The country has obviously attracted all manner of businesses from around the world and established a good share of their own. It isn't necessarily going to benefit everyone, but a rising tide does lift all boats, and even working class residents are enjoying a better quality of life today thanks to these companies. Although, I do expect to be shouted at in the comments section for saying that, so, you know, 
like and subscribe to make me feel better. Either way, the nation gets an 8 out of 10. Altogether, this gives Ireland an average score of 8.6 out of 10, only just falling behind Hong Kong, which isn't technically a sovereign nation, so this score is unbelievably impressive. It goes to show that being in the right place at the right time with the ability to provide the right services is a trait that will pay dividends for a very long time. And being in the right place with the right people is made a lot easier with trends. Trends isn't just another website with incredibly detailed articles about all the tech and business trends that you definitely need to be aware of right now. No, Trends is much more than that. At its core, Trends is a community. A community of like-minded hustlers and founders, people that you can run your ideas and perhaps even partner with to build your startup. And while you're networking with awesome members of the Trends community, don't forget to RSVP for live webinars hosted by industry-leading CEOs. If webinars aren't your jam, then consider taking a look at the Signal section of Trends, where you can view an endless array of detailed analytics into all of the latest sectors that are taking off right now. Analytics prepared by some of the smartest people on the planet. Analytics that were previously only available to hedge fund managers and other top investors. Feel free to try out Trends right now, all for just $1 by going to trends.co slash economics explained. Again, that's trends.co slash economics explained. The link is on the screen now and in the video description below. Thanks for watching guys, bye.